several stories have been told reports on the era presented statements of facts large in the history of dominica but have we heard from the culprit in chief the man, the man who was at the helm of it all the man in the direct line of fire during this defining moment of dominica's political history why well he is patrick Olin john the first prime minister of dominica the man at the center of the action the man whose government fell a mere six months following the island's independence someone who should have an insight a say a voice his stake on his downfall is therefore presented in this exclusive interview type documentary and here is how our conversation began i wanted to zero in on the aspect of your time just before your government fell please share with us what happened during the time when the labor party government led by you limited off yeah so that is just a quick introduction to the that we are about to have this evening. A pleasant good evening to one and all and welcome to this very important conversation. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, I am Simone Matthew and this evening we are joined by Mr. Alex Bruno whose interview you began to listen to at the beginning of the program and we're also joined by Mr. Simeon Joseph, the spokesman for the Patrick, the uh, Patrick John family in Dominica. So a pleasant good evening to you and thank you for joining us for this very important conversation on the life and life of Dominica's first Prime Minister, uh, the man who led Dominica into independence from the British monarchy, Mr. Patrick Roland John. As many of you are aware, Mr. John passed away a few months ago and he was laid to rest on September 30th. So uh, last week he was laid to rest. So it is important. This is an important conversation that we're having because we may be familiar with his past. We may be familiar with some of the myths about Patrick Roland John, but I also think that it is very important to have a conversation about how he should be memorialized. So I thought we could have two people who spend extensive periods of time with Mr. John join us today. And so we have here Mr. Alex Bruno and Mr. Simeon Joseph, and we'll just jump right in and have them introduce themselves and just tell us how they came to know Mr. Patrick Roland John. So Simeon, thank you for being here. Let me unmute your mics as we get the conversation started. And I will go and share the link with you as well so you can share it on your end. So go ahead, Simeon. Ah, uh, good evening to Simeon. Thank you for having me on the program. Uh, also, good evening to your listeners, Alex my uh, compatriot, fellow villager, <laughs> um, uh, the distant cousin, and, and, and how you call it, almost neighborhood friend. We share the, the close proximity of friendship between my father and your grandfather, Mr. Nibs Alexander. I cannot go on the program this afternoon without mentioning Nibs Alexander. Uh, because of, uh, you know, when you think of, of, of Patrick John, the labor stalwarts, Calibish, all those things, there are some key persons who, who, who were in what you call the boy of labor, so to speak. So, Alex, that is our connection going way back. Um, so, I, I, all I would say is I've known Patrick John from a very early age. Uh, I would say from the age of about six or seven, thereabout. Um, I was, uh, when um, uh, just the, uh, how, how can I say, his, uh, his nativity into my life, so to speak, came about when he used to visit some neighbors of mine, um, the Lawrences on Jepson's Lane. Um, we lived on 14 Monroe Street. The Lawrences lived on Jepson's Lane. And Patrick and Desri were close friends of Rita um, Lawrence and her children. And, and so um, um, that's how I first met him. Uh, fast forward about two or three years later than that, um, he was about to go up as a candidate for the Labour Party uh, in Rosa North. And so he came home with Mr. Christian, Mr. Liblan, my father. And I saw this short man articulate, uh, expounding in a way. And, and it sparked an interest for me that I wanted when I grew up to be that kind of person, able to speak uh, with that kind of uh, fluency and articulation. Fast forward again to my um, late primary school years when um, 
I, I, I happened to have been to have encountered Patrick on the Newton Savannah on the night that they were going the day that they were going to launch Eustace Francis uh, on the Newton Savannah in the old shop of Mr. Lloyd and he he called me and I didn't know that he knew me he said young Joseph and then I turned around and he said Patrick John and he gave me one statement that has stuck with me from my life don't let your father down and and that has stuck with me and then, as I said, my interest and my keen observation of Patrick John led me into um, the 1975 election. As a matter of fact, Simon, I don't know if I'm allowed to give a little vignette there, that on the night Eustace Francis was being launched on the Newton Savannah, um, I sneaked out. I jumped a back window of my uh, the boys' room at the time and passed through our uh, backyard garden down to the uh, side of the Anglican Cemetery onto the field of the Newton Savannah to listen to that political meeting. At that political meeting, it was very significant for me because Patrick John introduced Babs Dyer and Ronan David as two lawyers of poor working class people who had come back to Dominica into the legal system. Before that, they were just um, sons of the elite, so to speak, who were really the lawyers of Dominica, the Amors, the Francis's, the Jupinis, et cetera. And Patrick um, um, introduced these two sons of working class women um, to the Dominican public on that night. It was also that night that he uttered for me what I found one of the most poignant political statements ever, which has been attributed to Mike Douglas. And that statement was, they can come as much as they will, but we will confound their politics. We will frustrate the dirty tricks and we will give them endless leaks. And that stuck with me. I came very excited. I went home the next day and I stood on the side step of our veranda. And here was I talking to trees and branches. Um, um, uh, how you call it? Uh, uh, copying Patrick John, so to speak. Uh, and with this, and then that. So, and then following that, my keen interest in politics led me to just um, follow the man. And um, subsequently, I met him once when I went to see my father, who was working at the government headquarters as local government commissioner. He was coming up the steps, and he asked me about school. I was in common entrance class at the time, and I told him what I was struggling with. And he said to come to Mon Bruce to see me when you want to answer questions. And I said, so I, I took up the offer. And, and from then, um, PJ would, when he come from work in the afternoon, PJ would... Uh, Question me on what I learned at school. My class teacher at the time was Arthur Smith at the Rosa Boys School and um, subsequently Lennox Linton in my common entrance class. Two very uh, challenging teachers to me. Arthur was social studies. Lennox basically was English and class teacher. And so um, during those years, um, um, every afternoon, PJ would drill me on my Who's the prime minister of St. Kitts? Who's the prime minister of St. Lucia? Who's the governor general of So? Who is this? Who is that? And I would have to respond to him. And then subsequently, he assisted me with writing my English uh, uh, essays for my extra classes, which I was doing at the time at the Rose of Boys School under Miss, Miss James. And so that grew our, our friendship, that uh, developed our connection with each other, and because my family at the time lived not too far from uh, the house of the prime minister, and um, I, I began, used to listen to my mother on the utterances of people who were anti-labor at the time and how they would castigate labor rights. And, and at that time, the, the Freedom Party was growing in strength. And because the Freedom Party was growing in strength, the, 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 the labor rights at the time were often intimidated and, 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 and made to feel that it was wrong to be a laborite and you had to be a freedomite no matter what. If you were not a freedomite, you might as well be better off dead. And so um, that strengthened me um, into listening to, to the, the ears of PJ, so to speak. And then another, um, in, uh, another scenario again is when I was in my later years in grammar school and um, I would continue to go to Mount Bruce. And one of the things that struck me was when PJ came home one day, he put on his briefcase. I can still see him in his cream um, um, shirt, jack suit, and he a uh, brown shoes. And he put down his suitcase. What he did was he changed his clothes and... While I was on the porch, 
at the Prime Minister's residence at Mount Bruce on a desk that was there doing my homework or writing a, a thing that I saw PJ ironing in clothes. And it struck me, I said, here's the Premier of Dominica, he was not Prime Minister yet, coming home and ironing clothes. And it struck me. And I, I, and he used to have a lot of shirt jacks. And at grammar school, we used to wear shirt jacks at the time. And we had someone ironing for us as a family who used to come home. And I, I said, look at this. And then what happened was um, I, I, I had problems ironing clothes. And so I asked him, but how do you iron? He let me iron one of his uh, cotton shirt jacks at the time. He used to have crimping shirt jacks, polyester shirt jacks. And he used to have cotton shirt jacks at the time. And so he was ironing one of his yellow um, cotton shirt jacks, and he taught me. And from then on, subsequently, I went home, and every Sunday afternoon, I then began to iron my shirt jacks for grammar school. I was involved in the labor youth um, organization movement, and fast forward to having gone to study, come back to Dominica, and engaging Desiree and Patrick John at the time, because in the early 80s, my family and the family of Patrick John were perhaps the two most victimized families in Dominica under the Freedom Party government. My father suffered, my mother suffered, my brother sister suffered, my sister suffered, and we were all, uh, and I too suffered as a young labor writer under the hands of Freedomite on three specific occasions in Dominica. And so that, uh, how you call it, that correlation of victimization that that mutual experience of 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 getting uh facing the antagonism of the might of the freedom party brought our families even closer together much closer together and so um desri became my friend pj became my friend and over the years i have continued to maintain contact with desri and patrick even during their sojourn of people who were close to them People who were uh, intimately involved in their lives in the past abandoned them because at one time PJ was like an anatomacet. And so Desri had to um, carry the burden of, of being a strong woman to stand by her husband and I would say her man, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, because that is how you put it, you know, if you are to ascribe to that song by Dolly Parton, you know. And so um, that is it. And then I, I was always sympathetic and sorrowful to what Patrick John went through and what Desri went through. And not only Desri and Patrick, but Patrick's first children, if his first wife, Patricia, Hephelia, and so forth, what they what they suffered and Rennick and these people because they were Patrick John's children. And also to Neri and to a less extent Aisha. Neri, I remember the days when my family on the during the the the, the, the hiatus of 1979. We had to smuggle Neri John wrapped in a blanket at the dark of night across to the, the Robinsons, the neighbors, and sometimes take him to our home and my sister Margaret and so we take care of him. Because the animosity against Patrick John was so strong that we were afraid for the life of Neri. And in the dark of night, we had to bring Neri home to ensure that in case anything, he would be safe. And so these are experiences, experience of being a mentor, experience of being a close friend, experience of, of, of helping them to be a, 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 a Simon Peter to carry our crosses together and go through that whole cathartic movement of enduring victimization and pain and suffering and alienation only because of a different political opinion. Yes, but, and I want I to yeah. thank you for that, um, Simeon. It sounds like he had a profound impact on your life and he was a Definitely. mentor. And you also speak very well of his humility as well. And I'm going to acknowledge everyone who's joining us on the Facebook Live this evening. But I want to say a special good evening to Mrs. Desri A.W. John, the wife of Mr. Patrick Roland John, who is joining us via Facebook Live. Good evening, ma'am. And thank you for the correction that he was laid to rest on September 29th. And before we acknowledge the rest of our Facebook audience, I want to go over now to Mr. Alex Bruno as he tells us how he came to know Mr. Patrick Roland John and he even, even had the opportunity to conduct several interviews with him. So, Alex? Hi, what's going on? Greetings to my brother, Simeon. It's nice to share this platform with him. Simeon, as he quite rightly said, is my dear friend. Going way back, we are 
from Kalibishi together and we are neighbors in every aspect. My grandfather was one of the pillars of labor. He died being a strong labor right. The last words he told me, well, not the last words, but words put it into the Labour Party was was that that we did the and our labor, you know, but we still our labor man. Meaning what is there now is not labor, but he's still a labor man. I'm Sylvester Joseph is uh one what I call him e I say I refer to him in the present tense because to me, people like this do not die. Their spirit live on. Uh, Simeon's dad um, was is a mentor, a dear friend, a stickler for the tales and the professionalism. And he too was a staunch labor man. I know of the victimization that his entire family suffered. Um, I did not know Patrick as a boy at the tender ages that Simeon knew him, but I knew him from my home because my grandmother, Manibs, who would have been 91 today had she been alive. Patrick Sr. by a few years adored Patrick John. So it was a bit bizarre for me after a while when she started hating him. I didn't know what happened then, but I understood later on the, the, the sort of rumors and stories which were spread because people like my grandmother who not like Patrick, it was like night and day. So I, although I had not known Patrick from the time when I was a boy, but I was affiliated to him and his work from my home because my home had always been a labor home. Of course, my acquaintance to Patrick started when I moved to Rose Oak and I worked at DBS for a little while. I got fired, again, victimized by the Freedom Party um, in 1990, somewhere there about, um, or was it 89, somewhere there about. Um, so I lost my job as a police because they said I was affiliated with some party that had been newly formed. And then I was, I got back my job through a tribunal they took me out, for, out on broadcasting and put me on the spots desk. So it's through the spots desk I got to get acquainted with Patrick John, and I started really working with him and realized that he was such a humble person. So my relationship with Patrick personally goes back at least a couple of um, um, dozen, at least 20, the better part of 20 years, and I would have interviewed Patrick on records at least six to seven times, and I retain all these rec all these recordings and so on. Desri, for some wonderful reason, I thank her, allowed me access to Patrick every time I called. And I must say thanks to Desri because Desri turned off almost everyone else from speaking with Patrick. So Desri, I must say that uh, I thank you publicly and I will do the best to honor Patrick's cherished memory because he indeed was a gentleman that Dominica has not even begun to know in terms of his humility, the depth of his heart, his passion, and the love that he really has or had for the Dominican people. So in a nutshell, that's it. I, I cannot claim to know Patrick from the time I was a boy, although I know him from my house, my home circle. But in terms of a professional relationship, I can confess that for over two decades, Patrick and I, we shared a very good friendship, a very good bond, and a wonderful exchange in terms of professional information, which I am willing to share. And I certainly will share um, courtesy the John family, again, um, pending Desiree's blessings and approval and Simeon, of course, who is the official spokesperson for the family. So it's a pleasure to be here. Simone, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. And so we're just going to jump right in. We're going to talk about the challenges, the successes of Mr. Patrick Rowland John. But before we do so, um, Alex, I went ahead and shared the link to your interviews because I think that they are profound and um, every Dominican should hear from Mr. John his own words in terms of his administration, his life, the importance of sports, the important role that sports played, his role as a union man in Dominica. So I went ahead and posted a link to your interview. And if anybody's interested in the other interviews, they can simply um, type in Alex Bruno to get access to the interview. So I just want to take a pause and acknowledge everyone who's joining us via Facebook Live. I see we have Lorraine Delsol, uh, Tina Bell, the Ramon, Glenda, and of course I will not be able to call all the names because we have quite an audience this evening and we're very happy that you're joining us um, this evening. Andre, uh, Mrs. Desri John, who I mentioned before, Mr. Derek Ra Peters, Mr. Dr. Damian Dublin is also here with us. Uh, Mr. Naren King Murphy is here, Reverend Laurencia, Alfred, and the list goes on. So let's jump right into the conversation as we talk about, in your view, some of the successes of Mr. Patrick Roland John, some of his challenges along the way, and then 
we will conclude with how he should be memorialized. But who's just joining us? I am Simone Matthew, and you're listening and watching our interview with Mr. Alex Bruno and Mr. Simeon Joseph. And we're speaking on the prime minister, the very first prime minister of, of Dominica, Mr. Patrick Roland John, and how he should be memorialized at this point. So let's get into the conversation. Alex and Simeon, your thoughts on challenges and successes. Uh, Alex, what you want to go first? Where, where should we start? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> we have as much time as you guys have. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think probably we should begin with debunk, debunking the myths. I think that yes. has to be taken care of before we get into um, Patrick's achievements and his successes. Because there is a, I think the biggest myth, and Tim may not agree, about Patrick, uh, in that he, he really had a craving for power and an overzealous um, passion for power. And that is not true. Totally, 100% not true. Patrick had a passion for people. He loved the people. And if Patrick understood the extent to which he could bend his power to assist people, Patrick might have done that. Or Patrick probably knew and he just didn't care about it. Patrick was cavalierish, down to earth, ghetto if you want to say that for a, a better term. And Patrick didn't care too much about the system and the, and the society. Patrick was like a one-man army against the civil, like the civil society. And he was all about people, representation, empowering the, the ordinary man, the small man. He used that term, the man, the man, the man, as a, as a metaphor for a, a sort of reassurance that and people are human beings with dignity. Mm -hmm. and, and everything he said was about the man. So Patrick was all about the people, not about the power. So Simeon, I would yeah. like us to debunk that yes. very vicious myth about certainly. Patrick John. Yes. For the people who say that he's his quest for power who brought him down. That is so unfair but you see, absolutely unfair. But you see, Alex, one of the greatest challenges that Patrick faced eh, is the fact that too many people try to define Patrick for who they wanted people to believe that he is, yes. that he was. And unfortunately, the Dominican society has not drifted away from that venomous... Uh, insightful attitude of trying to define others by how they want other people to know them. That was one of Patrick's greatest challenges. And so in essence, because Patrick, you see, was a man, people knew that Patrick was a fighter. Yes. Patrick was a fighter. Yes. But he was never a fighter for himself and on his behalf. And so because he was never a fighter for himself and his behalf, he never saw the need to fight against those who were trying to bring him down and to get the better of him. He was often very dismissive of attacks coming to him. Yes. And sometimes would make a joke out of it and dismiss it, even throughout his life in terms of, um, I'm not sure if Alex can remember, but once Alex, um, I think you alluded to it in one of your interviews with him. When I had the opportunity to speak to Patrick, I said, Patrick, speak to me about your days at HHV Witch Church and oh, come yes. to Yes. And while as a young man working at HSV Richard and Company, he had to deal with some of his supervisors, mm -hmm. like Mr. Coltad and yes. Mr. Deloney and, and these people. And, and you see, one of the things, the fortunate things that I have had the opportunity to do is that in spite of listening to Patrick, I have been able personally to verify a lot of what Patrick told me about himself with other people, even some of his yeah. arch enemies. Because you see, I'm the kind of person, Simon and Alex and the listeners, if you tell me something about Alex and Simon, and I, I'm not going to take it, or if Alex or Simon tells me something, no, you have to be eclectic and globally minded to realize that there's one, two, three, four and sometimes five sides to a story before you can come up with the veracity of the content of what people are trying to tell you. And so I had, because at one point I remember, and why I have been fortunate is that at one time, Mr. Coltad at Richard was my next door neighbor at Mon Bruce. He lived just in front of us after Hurricane David. My home was where he bathed and did everything. No, that was after Hurricane Maria. 
And I grew up knowing that man vociferously against Patrick John until Hurricane David after Patrick was overthrown. And then he had to come home. His son David Coulter and I were very close friends. And one time when he came home, and then um, I don't know what happened. And then in 1980, when Patrick was arrested, not for the overthrow, but for the non-refundable of $42 and change traveling to Lawrence. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Oh, he had traveled. It, oh. it was, yeah, it was um, yeah. some money. Yeah. You know, when you travel as, as yeah, uh, refund, yeah. Mr. Uh, head of state. So he, he, he traveled. Had given an advance. Advance. Given an advance. Allowance advance. Yeah, and then whatever you spend, you return. You minus whatever you spend from the advance and you return the portion that right. you spent. So he had not yet returned the portion that yes, he, Alex, spend he did spend on the advance. Yes, he did. He did. Well, the story is, the story is, there was a discrepancy between the amount that was written much. because he, he had asked the cabinet secretary, Mr. Signoret, to file the return, to attend to that point. I think he was traveling. And when the financial secretary, I think, questioned him, he asked Mr. And then what happened? It was the exchange rate between the US dollars. Okay? That so, in other words, at that time, Dominica had just been twinned with the, help me know. The the easy the, currency, the, peg, the US the, currency. The US. Yeah, that was somewhere right. in nineteen. And so US, when yeah, he filed his return, there was a difference because I think he used the wrong exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And so they had arrested him for that. That was the first thing. In other words, they had investigated him for corruption first and foremost. Yes. When Miss Charles came into power, she had what you call a, an inquiry made up of Desmond Blanchard, Bradley Hector, and um Ozzy Lewis. Ozzy Lewis was the director of audit. What I is. think um, Mr. Mr. Bradley Hector was the uh, whatever in Treasury. And Desmond Blanchard was a policeman, I think, in charge of CID. Okay? Uh, I would dare say a very vindictive man. Who were telling, who were telling liberate he's coming to get them? He told my father at some point, you're driving to me, you're riding a high horse, and I have to bring you down. So this was the language being used by these people. And so they investigated Patrick for months for corruption. They found nothing. They went in there with the investigation saying that he had built his house with money from communications and works. That he had, he had um, what you call it, accounts overseas and all those things. Yeah. And they found nothing. All they found was that traveling allowance discrepancy, the discrepancy and the rest the for it. Mm -hmm. so then when i heard mr colter says mr colter at that time may he soul rest in peace and uh, you know sometimes people say you don't speak ill of the dead but when you're speaking the truth and you're speaking facts you know you're not misquoting or lying about anybody so your conscience is clear so mr colter said good at last they got him and i asked why and i had to i sat down and i spoke with him and he, the way he spoke about Patrick, and then I had occasion now to speak to Patrick about it, and then to make one and one make two for connections. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so when we're speaking about challenges, you have to remember that there were a lot of people in the mercantile community. There were a lot of, uh, how you call it now, petty bourgeois, you would call that, because yeah. in those days, Dominica was the petty bourgeois. The people who felt that because they had a certain status and position in society, they were above and beyond other people in the community. Huh? Um, um, bourgeois, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, and Patrick, they felt, who was Patrick? And remember, Patrick moved into we church, not as an ordinary thing. Patrick moved into we church, into the shipping agency. And of course, you know, that kind of thing. And so he faced so he faced those challenges there as a, as a young man. And so a lot of people defined PJ. That was one of his biggest challenges, I, I could say. That one of his greatest challenges, if we're talking about challenges, is uh, uh, Patrick was always a victim of persons who sought to define him based on how they wanted people to understand who he was. And knowing fully well that the person whom they were characterizing was not the actual man in essence of who patrick was you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. and so i turn over to alex now i don't know yeah, yeah i just want to make uh, i'm going to come to the facebook live comments at some point but mrs john desiree john says labor rights were called yay neg so i can only imagine the amount of animosity that uh was uh sent towards labor rights at that time alex you yeah. want to proceed that is true that is quite true um in in fact what was really happening during Patrick's era was 
again, it wasn't just local, it was global, eh? because mm -hmm. the world was gripped in this ideological political warfare. And somehow the opponents of Patrick successfully branded him on the wrong side of the politics. And they used that international fervor. Remember, remember Sparrow had made a song. Um, Patrick is a wanted man. Ali Butu is a wanted man. The Shah of Iran. That was during the time of Idi Amin. Of, yeah, Idi Amin, all of this. So that, that was the time when the world was up in arms against um, the, the dictatorial leaders and, and questionable characters. And PJ was placed in that ilk. So the people, the petty bourgeois, used who wanted power and who, who would never get power but they had been in opposition for like 20 years already and it would have been probably 50 years today had, had this not happened they used the the the, the 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 fervor of the time to successfully brand patrick and collapse the labor party and since then the labor party has never recovered eh? what we have in power now is not labor i will speak about that a bit later on but the last real labor leader was patrick well we had mike after patrick but mike didn't do much because after Mike, we had Ruzi and Piero and now the present leader. All these guys come from different political ideologies. We know Piero was an alliance, DLM. Um, um, Ruzi also was alliance, communist, they call him. Um, and we can talk about how we turn, how we, how we connect the isms between socialism and, and capitalism in terms of the new junior chat and form this power sharing arrangement that this present prime minister now benefits from. He is not a labor, right? No, but in no, in no way, in no, in not even a glimpse of the imagination that he is a labor right. He does not understand the fundamentals of labor. He does not operate at that way. He does not lead that way. So the people who led Dominic after Patrick, save Mike, have not been people who understood labor and labor philosophy, including Pierre, who I admire, admired and loved dearly. He understand grassroots. But we all know that he was not in the ideal, in the ilks of labor. And, so and Peter Mike, essentially was the last yes. labor person that yes, he was yes. about. And, and Alex, we don't want you to cut you across. Mm -hmm. There is, Mike actually said that he was not a labor, he was a social democrat. See. You understand yeah. what I'm telling you? Yes. And, and, and that was strengthened throughout his time within the Labour Party even when he left the Labour Party and when he assumed the leadership of the Labour Party, he said he's a social democrat. You understand what I'm telling you? Yes, and so yes. um, we don't want you to, I just want to, I just throw yes. in that in you because you see there are some things that we have to highlight. Which qualifies the statement that I'm making that PJ yeah. was the last real Labour right and there's a speech that I'll play sometime later on which where he says that, save the party. Here's what we need to do. These people want to get rid of Labour and if they get rid of Labour, they are going to control you forever. He said so in a speech. But we didn't listen. And now we parade in saying that labor, labor, labor. Yes, the labor frame is being used in terms of the power that we have, the sharing arrangement that we have in power now. But it's essentially not the labor that was established by Isilo Black, was inherited by Ioli Blanc, and was passed on to Patrick John. That is not the same labor, right? The ideas and philosophy and principles of all shall eat. Mm -hmm. I was about to say it. Fall. I was about to Does say not it. All shall eat. Anymore. PJ yes. would have never. You know what PJ told me once, Simon? Man, he can never be a money man, man, and be poor and hungry. You, know? you see, Alex, I can. I will die broke. Because what sense does it make for me to have so much and my people are suffering? I mean, flip the script and put it into the present context and look at what we have. I mean, is that labor? Somebody's going to have to convince me because I am. I grew up in the labor um, family. I grew up in the labor, labor ideology. My grandfather was a resolute labor man. I He brought me up. I was born in his arms and my grandmother. So I understood. I thought what labor was. Um, and Patrick was the epitome of a labor leader, leader and probably the last real labor stalwart. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can develop that in many areas. Again, I'm not here casting as persons. I'm just here putting the context on the discussion that we're having and history in terms of the politics of our country. And if there's any true labor right who wants to refute it, they can say, okay, refute it. But I'm just offering what I think I have, what I learned from Patrick, and what I understood on my own um, research based on yeah, yeah. the policies of Dominica. Dominica uh, and, 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 and speaking of which, of course, this is beyond my years in terms of his reign. But if, even as a young child, and today while I was preparing for this conversation, I was speaking to my mom, and we're always reminded of the housing schemes that he, 
that he created. I grew up in the Baffisted housing scheme and my mother speaks fondly of going to his office mm -hmm. to speak with him and talking about receiving one of those homes and yes. he explaining to her the homes are not ready. But my mom um, told him that she, it took, takes a woman to make, she will make the house a home, but we had to pay for them. Yes. That Unlike the what we see now where the apartments are supposedly being handed over for free. So there's no incentive for the occupants to pay for them. So it just brings a different type of ethics where, where people are handed um, homes and material goods as opposed to having them pay for it because it gives you a sense of pride. It gives you a sense of this is something I have to work to ensure that I can maintain. I have to work so I can secure this property for my family. So I certainly can see what um, you and Simeon are referring to in terms of the Labour Party that are uh, provided for the people, yes. not through handouts, provided but through means. opportunities. And before yes. Simeon jump in, that's a good point that you make, and that's the major difference between the housing that Patrick did. And he did a housing project scheme in Calibishi as well. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. And Kenfield. And Kenfield. And there are people who own that house still, who developed it and paid people like Tao and them. Yes, yes. we still, but, we still but, own ours. We still Alex, own Alex, it, was, Alex, it was more than a housing project. Yes. Patrick actually acquired for the people of Calibishi that entire Savan Pie Ridge. Which is prime real estate. Okay. And mm -hmm. one of the things he did was that was one of his main main things in life that in almost every community from the landholding class, he was going to acquire land for that the people of the community can go there, get and, and the land was pretty cheap. Um, get a house, have a certificate of title, and put up a land for them to use. And that's how the housing scheme came, because yes. the land had been designated for Calibishi for a while. Yes. And there are many people who had not yet built their houses because they could not afford to build of the course. houses. And that's why PJ decided, I have to put at least some houses there. Because if I do not begin the process, and your um, Alex, yes. your grandfather was part of this in helping to identify who should be the beneficiaries? Who should benefit from the houses? Take from this land up there, yeah. you know. And, and, and he said one time that he was like a land scavenger, just getting land, and he had to occupy the land before he lost the land in yes. the name of the people. Yes. And, and he would say, "Look, and, this is not for free. Just let me know what you can pay. If you can pay five cents, pay. Yes. If you can pay ten That's cents, it. pay. Yes. But pay something on it because it becomes right. yours after you finish paying off the amount that we owe on the land on the house." And my father told the story once of. When he saw Calibishi people not going for the land, he told him, come and grab the land before people from outside come and come take and the take land it. and all you. Yes. And yes. that is how it started. Osborne Theodore, um, um, help me, uh, El Elford Henry at the El time. Henry. Even Mr. Uh, Bur Burley Mr. Williams. You know, yes, Burley Williams you know, and these people. Were very, I'm very much involved in and this. That is why today there's, a, there's a lady in Calibishi called Tao. Poor I, I, I just call her name. <laughs> You just you just say <laughs> and she ready to come for you. When I Labour Party has it. the convention, when the first person, if the convention starting at three o'clock or nine o'clock, tower dress on the side of the road if her red. Yes, oh, boy. Boy. Tower and man and only two tower would be in Calibishi and, choir, but and if there's may, one time, yeah, yeah, Tao, Manibs, Mewo, Mama would say, me. Oh, don't talk about Mewo. Are, they are the, I mean, they, I mean, they would not, they will not change for ever. They are labor, they are consummate labor, right? Yes. So Simeon is right. And that Simeon is why Simeon. people, yeah, that's why people like mommy. And yes. you see, Alex and Simon, there are some people who have remained in this quote unquote labor party, and I can understand why. Mm -hmm. Because they, they have an affinity to labor, and they might feel betrayed if they leave the labor party that is there. Mm -hmm. Because mommy will tell you, mommy herself is another story of somebody who Patrick John personally touched as a laborite when she came from Curacao yeah. and was given some property at King's Hill. So, you know, sometimes um, we see people um, and we don't, but but we, we if we know their stories, we can appreciate uh, where they stand in life. Um, mm -hmm. But but you see, coming back to challenges, eh? um, um, Alex and Simon, Patrick John always faced the challenge of a sector the Dominican society and the political directorate of postulating the position that 
he was not fit to be leader of the party. Mm. Now, if you go back to the era of the Winstons and the Eustace Francis and the Amores and all those people, and even the Ed, and the Ed, and and he experienced the same thing that Lee Blanc encountered when people Oof. like N A N Ducre and so felt that that little boy from Vekas. Hmm should not be the leader of the because you see the labor party transitions from the dupp where you had that sort of creole mulatto bourgeois class rule in dominica the land holding class the financially um, um superior class the, the the color of the skin sector of society who felt that 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 there was too much of a quick transition from the white man to the black man so people with higher color were the ones who were supposed to inherit yeah, the, the governance of this country before the black people. Hmm. And so they made it difficult. And that is why when you look at the labor rights who challenged Libla and Patrick from the 16s and the 17s, they are all high color people. Well, if you understand they, were the, they, they were the labor elites. Yeah, the they labor were, elites. They, yeah, they were the labor elites within the right. labor party. Right, and of course, and, with the Patrick Jones, and then so that the is Patrick another challenge, Patrick. yes, and that that's was another a, challenge. So he yes, continues so that's the that challenge, but but you know, but you know what strikes me because growing up in Dominica, we you know, I always had the sense that you know, we were not racist, we didn't see color, but it is so clear. The Dominic, no, Dominica I'm, is I'm so much right well, now, yeah. I'm so much. You need to speak, you need to speak. No, Simon, you need to speak to certain people. Go and talk to Janice Armour when she first went to work at the Royal Bank, <laughs> and she will share with you what she experienced as people. Go and speak to the first public servants in the public in, in, in government. Who will share with you what and, and dominic has a move we may not be racist but we're still very much a prejudiced society yeah it's not yeah it's not quite racist we have not graduated like high prejudice yeah. and privilege we have so not transcended dominica, yeah we had a because privilege if you, if you look, that's one of the criticisms i have of this quote-unquote current labor party where what has happened if you look at it very closely it is this higher echelons upper class uh pseudo nouveau rich sector of the society who refuse to give up their privilege and their status who will continue to hijack huh? and and control uh so to speak any government and they have attempted that they only they haven't done it now they did try to do it with miss charles and with edison james and that is why any political party any political movement that has as its core objective and philosophy the upliftment of poor people, the common man, the grassroots man will face violent oppositions from that sector of society because we have not transcended into that philosophical mindset that Dominica belongs to all and no one person has more rights or privileges than the other in this country. And we are still very much living under it, whether or not we like it. If you speak to people like even Archbishop Felix and Bishop Bowers when they came back as priests, they were Rosso people who refused to take communion from them. Talk no. to Father Jolly. Talk to Father yeah, Jolly. It, it is true. It they is true. They refused to take communion from the priests. Yeah. Yeah, it is not quite racism, but it's highly prejudicial and privilege. And privilege. Privilege. Yes. Privilege and, privilege. Privilege. And, yes. In, privilege in and church, prejudice. I remember in the church, Simeon, that there were particular pews reserved for people. Yes. And front. you could not sit in those pews because of, of, of you know, how you look. This yeah. pew was preserved for particular families. And even if they didn't come to church that day, you could not occupy the pew. So this is not to say anything negative, but it's just to put things into context in terms and, of what really has gone on. And Simeon made a point in terms of the ruling class, the privileged class. That remains in Dominica even as we mm -hmm. speak today. And it's not to say that is a negative thing that we are saying. It's something that we are putting in the right context. And pretty much the same ruling class have led Dominica since Patrick fell, because we had freedom, which was part of the plantocracy system arrangement. They came and um, they listened for 15 years, and they were changed by a party for four and a half years, five, four and a half years, which represented the grassroots, the kind of a labor type mentality, and the UWP was taken out. By whom? By the same Freedom Party who came together with the same 
labor at rival. So we have a kind of a power sharing arrangement in Dominica right now. The president of our country is a labor, is a freedomite. He's a freedomite of a labor party government. That does not make sense. And the current prime minister is a freedomite. How could that be labor? So the ideals of labor had been captured, hijacked, and used as a power sharing base. And that's pretty much what it is. And until labor rights understand that and wake up, they won't realize what it hit them. Because be labor rights, who were labor rights like Mami for how many years now? When she was a labor right, well, first of all, the prime minister was not born as yet. And he was not even a labor right. He became a labor right when the arrangement happened. And the present president, who I admire and love, is my good friend. He is never a labor right, never a labor right. So this idea of labor rights saying they're going to remain in labor and die in labor, they must understand people join labor and lead labor and bingo on them while they remain in the same status. So that is some of the things that the labor rights must think right. about, whether they really, whether that is really something that works for them, because it works for the leaders and the ministers. Most of them are not labor rights too. I can count about 10 ministers now who have never been labor rights. Yes, because and and, and, and Simeon, before before you jump in, I also want us to to take note of the manifesto of 1975. Um, Simeon, I know that you're very um, versed in <laughs> well, that. So if you I'll, can tell I'll us I'll about it, it, but in reference some of the to the plans what, he right, had for Dominica, yeah, right? In reference to what Alex is speaking about, you see, there's a difference between nomenclature for reference and purity of substance. You can say that you are something. But in essence and substance, you're really something else. Mm -hmm. And so it's not everybody who calls themselves by certain names are actually what they are. And throughout the political climate and landscape of Dominica, I have seen it. When I used to go up to Patrick John, home at Mount Bruce, there were a number of people who used to be at Patrick homes every day. So much so they used to call them Boom Boom Fly. They used to go PJ Boom Boom Fly. These people were at Patrick John's home every day of, 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 of different influential uh, uh, sectors in society. Lo and behold, when PJ fell, I saw these very same people trying to infiltrate the Democratic Labour Party of Oliver Seraphine. Oliver Seraphine fell. I saw these people circling the Freedom Party and Eugenia Charles. Mm -hmm. UWP came into power. I saw these people trying to, 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 to permeate their influence in UWP. And now for the past 20 years, I see these very same people now trying to grab the spoils of power and privilege. Okay? So these people are what you call nomenclature people by reference. They will be labor right today and freedom right tomorrow and be an UWP the next day. But then there is what you call people of substance. That no matter who comes and goes, you remain the same. You understand what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. And so that is what people have to understand. And people have to know who they're fooling and who they're not fooling. And you can see them from a mile away. But but Simon, you wanted me to talk about the manifesto. Yes, please. And yes, I refer to it in the eulogy because I mean I still have my copy, but unfortunately, I've had to um or oh, you call it I I think oh I left it in the drawing room, <laughs> so I can't get up for it now. So I'll refer to it on my phone, you know. I have had to save a lot of the archives of the Labour Party. I mean, look at look at some of the old things. You see some of the old pit, old things of the Labour Party. Oh and my! I have had to. Yes, I have actually see one. I can show you. I have the original prayer of the Labour Party, 1960. Oh my! Can you, tell us, can you just, uh, tell us a little bit of what it says? I'm Simeon. Okay. And then I and I have the prayer of the of the um the election of 1975. And, and I have, I mean, all these Labour Party materials, you understand? And I have, what I have in my hand there, Alex, is the letter signed by O.J. Serafin, Patrick John, and Vic Rivera for the reunification of the Dominican Labour Party to contest the 1975 elections. You understand? These are the things that I have. So, so and, Simeon, Simeon, before you proceed, are we making an, any efforts to digitalize those things? Oh, yes, oh, yes. I, the I, I will, will just, destroy Simeon it. Simeon is savvy enough to know that okay. if he's searched tomorrow by the SSU, 
If his house is burned down tomorrow, when some discrepant, when you are it's not well, <laughs> it is and harangued and brought before the courts tomorrow and skinned and crucified alive, these things are well seen. When? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yeah, That's when? It. I mean, when? I can when? Understand you, but I mean, are there to know. And because remember, um, in this age of, of technology, mm -hmm. I, I will only bring it out now, but I've been working. Okay. So read, read, read some of what you have for us, Simeon. Read some of what you have. Prayer. Closing prayer from the 90th Deva Party. Um, oh, merciful Father, who has ordained that by the sweat of man's brow he shall eat bread, grant to us health and strength to pursue our daily toil with honest and right purpose. Help us to reap the fruit of our just labor and protect us from exploitation and unfair treatment. And help us to love one another. May we toil to be controllers of the results of our labor. May we be free from want, suffering, oppression, and poverty. Read us from all selfish motives and make us appreciate nature's interdependencies. Make our country a better place for us to live. And at last, let all our members unite in one grand family and lead us to our homes safely. That was the closing prayer. So here's the opening prayer. The opening prayer reads as follows. O Lord, we the Labour Party promise thee this day to love and serve thee, to remain faithful to our party, to uphold its principles, policies, and constitution, to observe the laws and keep discipline, to foster the development of the state and the masses, to dwell together in unity, and to achieve success. Amen. That's the yeah, present. Before we jump into the manifesto, your thoughts on Facebook, we're I, coming. We see the we see the comments. I'll see thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh well, yeah. This so, is massive. So you this, see, is, this is massive. Huh? This is this is great, yeah. great, great. Oh yes. And, and, yes. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and and Simon, the thing is, this just start happening now. I mean, you haven't seen anything yet in terms of what is expected to be unleashed in terms of the legacy of Patrick. And I remember, you know, one time, you know, quickly, Simon. Mm -hmm. interviewing Patrick or asking permission to interview him on DBS and the management of DBS you know they, they, there was this thing that they did where they gave you a memo and you had to sign the memo and give it back to them so you didn't get to keep a copy of the memo and they had me sign a memo agreeing what to do and what not to do with the Patrick John interview what question I cannot ask him and if he starts speaking about certain things cut him off and everything all the instructions on what I should yeah. ask and what I shouldn't ask and that that, you know, that was the, the, the that big, was the, yeah. I was a distasteful the big interview that people did. Yes, they, I sign, and you have to sign in the presence yes. of the manager. They take it back from you, and you uh, are sworn by what you sign. Yes, I and just cannot show it now because they never right. gave it. But mm -hmm. they try to muzzle everything about Pat and stifle him. Even when I interviewed him. him on the radio, it was a skeletal interview. Yes, and I stifle could not him into certain areas. But I did that for my own. That's why. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's why. Whenever. You hear anything about Patrick John, including the Football Association, which is very circumspect, you have to think twice. If yes. you speak to what I'm telling you, Jim, I'm giving you my experience as a still. national broadcaster. You know. Right. I know. That's it. If you speak to Edison James, former prime minister, he will tell you when he was trying to establish and well, not establish, but strengthen and broaden the Dominica Solid Waste Corporation. And he mentioned Patrick John. To lead Dominica Solid, there were permanent secretaries and people in government who were saying Patrick mm -hmm. should not be given that job because of Patrick John. And what is sad, what is sad, although Patrick did a lot to expand Dominica Solid Waste Corporation, one of the first items on the agenda of the Dominica Labour Party when they won in 2000 was to send Patrick at his home. The father for independence, the first prime minister, a man who needed and to have born man, you know. daily and bread, leaders. he was sent home. So you see, Simon, um, who don't know, don't know. And as I'm saying, you know, I saw some people chat saying we're trying to canonize Patrick. We're not trying to canonize Patrick. We're not trying to make him into a saint. Patrick could be the first person to recognize that he had faults, that he made mistakes. Because if you spoke to him, he will enumerate his mistakes to you. His wife, Desri John. He's not ashamed of Patrick's mm. mistakes. His children are not. His closest friends are not. 
Patrick never denied his errors. Patrick never blamed others for his mistake. We I, and are, so and expound, on, expound on some of those mistakes that you think he maybe had second yeah. thoughts about, that he was concerned about. Oh, uh, well, when, I mean, second thoughts and concerns are different from mistakes. You know, mm -hmm. Patrick had a lot of second thoughts. Patrick had a lot of second thoughts throughout yeah. his life yeah. on several Patrick, things that he did. Patrick essentially was the trust thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, as, a, as a leader, he was the trusting of too many people. Yeah. And he took Definitely. people for granted. And he took things yeah. at face value. Well, One time yes. he told me, Alex, I didn't do my due diligence. Yeah. He, in, in his you ministers. Know, so, so Patrick's one, to me, if Pat, yeah, if Patrick had a flaw, I think his flaw was to trust the people who worked with him that they would do precisely honorable and, tasks. And one of the and, things, one of the things the that he, he with... one of the things that he has actually right. been 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 labeled for is for listening to Leo Austin too much. But I spoke to Patrick about that once, and I spoke to the Colonel of Honey Church as what he thinks was, you know, because you have to be an eclectic person, and any person who has who is has a thirst for knowledge, and uh, has a deep uh, search for the truth will never listen to one side and so many times whenever Patrick would defend himself I would seek even Mr. Christian when I wanted to find out the inner workings of the Labour Party Mr. Christian HL Christian at the time was in his room at, at, at Rose Street and I called him and I said I want to sit down and have a chat with you and I questioned him on a number of the things that Patrick was accused about okay that Patrick had defended to get a balanced view from a man of high integrity like Mr. Christian. And Mr. Christian would, would dispel a lot of the rumors that were said about Patrick. And one of the meeting grounds of, 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 of the Leo Austin issue, where it will converge, is that many people said, Patrick, listen to Leo Austin. But this is the situation that Patrick found himself in. Patrick had two legal minds around him. He had Leo Austin on one side, and he had Eustace Francis deceased on the other side. When Patrick John was elected leader of the Labour Party in 1974, leading up from 74 to 76, Eustace Francis was one of those in the cabal of the Labour Party who sought to remove Patrick, having organizing meetings with others. And OJ is alive, he can verify that. And Mike Douglas, and Ferdinand Parillon, and a few other echelons of the Labour Party to have Patrick be unseated as leader of the party. And so therefore, Patrick felt that the most reliable person to listen to as a confidant and a legal advisor was Leo Austin, because Leo Austin was more faithful to him. He yes. saw a friend in Leo. And so therefore, when you are caught between two legal advisors, one, you know, trying to stab you in the back, and the other who is standing by you. And then I asked him about that one. He said, yes, it was a mistake. Maybe I should have gone out of the sphere of the two legal minds around me and go to people like Jenna Amor and other people like that, you know, and, and, and even Babs Dyer at some point in the 70s. But then he told me, moving to late in the 70s, Babs Dyer himself had begun to turn from him. And so he felt, I just, Chief, yes, yeah, towards freedom. So he had no choice but to just stay with Leo Austin. He saw that as a mistake. He admitted that holding on to the advice of Leo Austin too much was a mistake, but he had no choice. The man was not a lawyer. And so his two legal minds among him when you have a choice. And that's what any human being would do uh, under, under these circumstances. Um, other mistakes he felt, Alex mentioned trusting as one of the things that Patrick, while he trusted too much, one of the reasons for that deep city trust in people and, is that he had faith in people. He saw people on their face value. He sometimes felt that unless somebody were to prove him wrong or otherwise, he would have no reason to disbelieve them. Let me tell you an example I saw once of Patrick as a young boy and a young person in the LYU. I remember once going up to Patrick's home. Um, I think it was about 1976, 70, it would have been before the 77 strike, the famous 77 strike, the 47 day strike. And um, Patrick, uh, she was still working at the agriculture section at the market because she was in the court first and then she was moved to the market. And Patrick came home one day. 
But before he came home, I went up there. There was a lady waiting for him outside her house, his house at Mount Bruce. Present was just the policeman because in those days there was no six men around the president and people dressed in army fatigue. PJ sometimes would drive himself up and down from work. Okay? And so this lady was there waiting for him and she said she came to see Patrick and she sat on the step at where the car used to park at Mount Bruce. Anyway, I went to the back on the porch, you know, and then when Patrick came in, he said good afternoon. He, he never called me Simeon. He never called, he's always Joe. That was always Joe, okay? Now, what's up? I said, I said, there's a lady waiting for you outside. Did you see him? See her? He said, no, I didn't see her. I went around, I went around, I looked. But through the bushes of the playing field next to the prime minister house, I saw the color of her dress through the hedge at where Osborne Theodore used to live at the time, before that um, Etienne from Dalis used to be staying there. And that is the house where Pierre Charles once stayed and the Prime Minister Roosevelt carried once stayed where they were Prime Minister. So that was the home for the Minister of Communications and Works at the time. And so Mr. Osborne Theodore was staying there. And I saw the lady through the bushes and I went to her and I said, Patrick came. So she came over to Patrick. And I don't know what, but I overheard the conversation where the lady said that her husband, I think, had a truck with a loan at Barclays Bank or something like that. Okay. And the bank was going to seize the truck or something like that. I think the man used to be carrying grapefruit. I don't know if you remember when they used to be carrying grapefruit to the packing shed in, in Fokole, the um, um, Don Goodwill, where the aid bank was. That's where the packing shed was. And she took, we know what I saw Patrick did. Patrick didn't ask the lady any question. If it's true, if it's not true, whatever. He had his salary check in his top left pocket. He took it out. He signed at the back, paid to sons, and he told her, go to Barclays Bank and change that and give it to your husband to pay off his loan. Wow. That's trust. That's, that's yeah. trust. He never, he, and I, I to this day, always wonder, I don't know if Desiree ever knows, I hope I'm not putting myself in trouble tonight. I, to this day, uh, always fathom, what did he tell Desiree that month friend when he came home without <laughs> his salary? Mm -hmm. So good try, we'll tell you. The, the one of the sons supposed to Patrick. That Patrick used to give him his salary check to take to go to the bank to change. And Patrick would take his salary, put it in his drawer. So when people come, he would give them a hundred dollars and fifty dollars and two hundred dollars from his drawer, from his salary. So go if I can verify that his money, yeah. His, his money, money not yeah. The so so money. Alex, not Alex, the Alex, money. chime in and then we must take the comments on the Facebook Live. So go ahead, Alex, no, and then yes, the Facebook not, Live comments. Yes, Simon. Not the state money that he has an, uh, an arrangement to get to give people in his personal money. Patrick is the, and one of the things that he did again, and, uh, and Simeon, was the, the dreads. I spoke with them at large in terms of the arrangement between the dreads and the state. And Patrick had actually asked the dreads to meet, to talk, come to his office. And they said, no, they're not coming to Patrick's office. He must come to the bush. But so he wasn't going to go, and they were not going to come. But the dread said in hindsight, they should have gone to the prime minister and at least give him the honor because he asked them to come, but they were being stubborn. You know what Patrick did at the end of the, the, the big rivalry and the dread act? And the, there was a truce. Yeah. A truce. And one of the, the deals that was caught was that Patrick, I think Simeon should know that, but he must have told you that. Yeah. Patrick gave the dreads a portion of his land at TFM. He yes. said, You can have the land. Yes. So the where did where did George have the civilization in TFM now was Patrick's land. Yeah. He just yeah. gave them the land. He just gave them his so property. That they could use as for the for the resettlement of the of the civilization. Because so some of these guys, who, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these guys were those who were involved in, in pest, pestering people in the bush. And yeah. well, Alex, I'm glad you told that story. So he told me, he asked them, but what do you guys want? What kind of what, how do we stop? He said, they want land. They want land. He said, okay. You want land? I have some land in Bells. If you want it, you can go and take it. And then he, he gave it to them. And that, that, that was the nature of the man. And he didn't confer with anybody too before no. he did that. Too. He Patrick had children. Say, I'm going to the... Patrick was just this kind of... Patrick had, Patrick had a first son, Renick. <laughs> okay? Patrick had children with his first wife. Yeah. Huh? You understand? Yep. I don't think Neri and them were born yet. No, they were not Patrick born. Patrick was married yet. to Desri. I don't think he consulted Desri. I don't think he, yeah, he told his children, okay, can I give away your, your, your inheritance? Huh? 
you understand what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. And God knows today how this children could have benefited from that land with from that their land. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the so kind if of anybody believes that we are colonizing and Patrick. And what what, what hurts me? Mm -hmm. What hurts me, eh, Alex and Simon, is that there are many people Patrick helped. And when Patrick they kept their mouth shut, they never told the stories of generosity and kindness that PG when, gave to people. When, when we yeah, tried, when I tried. <laughs> When I tried to speak about Patrick's story before Patrick's death many years ago, I was told I was conned by members in the society who warned me I'll lose my job and I will not get certain advantages. So I, like everything else, I was, you know, okay, well, if I'm the only one doing it, nobody else doing it. So best I, best I remain quiet. So for 20 plus years, I remained quiet because people were telling me that that man is a monster. And I knew he wasn't because I'm speaking to him every day in his home. How can he be a monster now? You're telling me he's, and I know he's not. So people may find, why is it that we are speaking now? We are speaking now because I guess the time is right. And Patrick's yes. legacy will come to life. Right. Following his death, and people may say we are canonizing Patrick. There's nothing that I've said no so far about Patrick that, have, right. that has glorified him in any undue way. Everything right. that we say about Patrick is the truth. Yes. So if you think and, that's canonizing, and what wait is until you hear. Annex, what is, what is distastefully ironical and John right ungrateful is that there are people on Facebook today since the eulogy on Wednesday on WhatsApp chats on Facebook castigating me saying mm -hmm. the most nastiest of things the dirtiest of things because I sought to uh, set the record of Patrick John Street that was a eulogy and if people understand what a eulogy is sometimes in a eulogy you have to tell the story of the person yeah, um, hold that thought, hold that thought, Simeon. I want to come back right where you are on the eulogy, but we must take some comments from Facebook Live because we don't want them to think we're ignoring them. So can you hold that thought for one minute? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, let's take some some comments from Facebook and we thank everyone who are joining us live on Facebook um, this evening as we stick, speak to Mr. Alex Bruno and Mr. Simeon Joseph, two men who spent extensive amounts of time with our late Prime Minister, the very first Prime Minister of Dominica, Mr. Patrick Roland John, and they're just we're, today we're talking about his challenges, his successes, as well as how, what will his legacy be in a nutshell. So let's just grab some comments from Facebook real quick. Uh, Rosalind said, my condolences, Desri John, the testimony is very sad to listen to. Uh, Desri says, Simeon, you are correct. Nayari had to smug had to be smuggled for his safety. So going back to the comment you made earlier, Derek Rapiders, these are battles that makes you uh, let's see Glenda Great Simone Great important and needed interview this evening. Thank you for that. Rosita, interesting perspective. Uh, thank you for from the UK, Rosita. Uh, Clarolyn Warrington, good evening to you all good program. Uh, Margaret Wallace, Dr. Triffy, I have childhood memories of those times being so heightened with uh, paranoia in the country. My stepdad kept his allegiance even as we young ones moved on to the Freedom Party as teenagers. The pain and trauma of those experiences must have been horrible for all of you. I maintain that I am so impressed with this gumption to push for our independence, sending you all love. Thank you for that. Louisa out there in the UK, thank you for being here. Indeed, the current labor rights are questionable. I'm not personally into politics, but I'm aware of the struggles of those who don't support current party. Didi Esther, appreciate this perspective on the life and times of PJ shared by Simeon Joseph and Alex Bruno. Shirley, in on the conversation, let's keep Patch's legacy alive. Alec Challenger, he was also the PAL rep for St. Joe after the 1985 election. Soon after that period, he was sent to prison in spite of the uprising. In 1979, he still had great support. So any comments on the Facebook Live comments? Because I'm so happy to see everybody's engaged in the conversation. And then um, Simeon will go back to your eulogy. Oh, well, well, Alex, we can say, but it comments on those. You see, one of the things I have, we can start with the eulogy. One of the things I have found um, since the eulogy is the number of people who it seems to me have been waiting 
for that expository on the life of Patrick John. I never thought that Patrick John was so loved, admired, and respected between his death and the burial. And since the burial, I have become enlightenedly amazed at the tumultuous outpouring of revelations that have come forth since I delivered that eulogy. I have, I, Alex, I don't know if I told you, I have received 1,213 WhatsApp messages without exaggeration. Wow. Of people sharing with me the experiences of Patrick John and they are happy that I did it. I have had quite a lot of requests for Facebook friends. Now the question I want to ask is, while my delay in exposing the myth and the lies and the fallacies about Patrick John was based on his request and that of his wife until his death. Not many people have had that privilege to be told, not yet. Where have all these people been all along? They stood silently by and quiet while PJ was made a nobody and almost thrown on the airships of history. So when I communicated with some of these people, why hadn't they spoken? They said they were afraid. They were afraid of reprisal and victimization. That they were afraid of their families being attacked. I wish to tell Dominicans tonight three important scriptural reference verses. One, greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world. So when the world attacks you, when the world come against you, if you are truthful, you need not be fearful. You should be fearless because the God above who is in you will give you the strength to confront the world that is coming at you. The second scriptural reference I want to share with them is we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And if we stand by justice, truth, right, fairness, and fair play, Christ will give us the strength to do those things in the face of lies, deception, victimization, vilification, and pain and grief. And the last one is, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. That we mustn't be fearful of having a house or losing a job or, or being denied opportunities or our children getting scholarship or we not getting a promotion or a salary or a piece of land or a loan. Take the suffering. Embrace the victimization because the God above is greater than all these people, be they politicians, institutions, or other persons who may want to victimize you. So you face your back ahead or knowing fully well that those at your back can do you no harm because you need not fear those in the world who cannot destroy your soul. But many people have destroyed their soul. They have sold their soul for jobs, for promotion, for positions, for land, for scholarships, for finance. And as a matter of fact, they become now very fearful because of what man can do to them. There is nothing that man can do to you with God on your side. And you have to know yeah. that. Yeah. You have to know that. And yeah, so that all these people who are coming out, no. Do not be afraid. Because I did it. I was mindful of the repercussions when we met, I met the family right after the funeral. And Neri was the one who suggested, and Renick, that I do the eulogy. Patricia was in full support of it. And so was um, Desri and the other, and, and um, what is her name? Um, the first niece, um, Naomi. I said, no, it must be a family member. They insisted no, and then Neary called her and said, no one else is going to do that eulogy but you. Okay? And I began to source information, although I, I didn't need any assistance to write about Patrick. But I wanted people who knew about Patrick to share in the revelation of Patrick. Alex, Brother German. Um, Lennox Honeychurch, Desri, the children, friends of Patrick, Eden Bowers, all these people. Because in presenting Patrick eulogy, I didn't only want it to be my perspective. It had to be the perspective of those who knew him, those who loved him, those who had the opportunity to speak to him. And so on the Tuesday morning, uh, I remember telling um, Alex, I, I haven't started yet this Sunday because I had a very busy week. So the Tuesday morning, I got up at 3 o'clock 
and I wrote the eulogy. I sent it to Neri and I sent it to Desri. And I said, what do you think? They say, okay, go ahead. Desri asked me to put in one or two things that I said I'm not going to put because anybody who knows Desri, John, know she has a very salacious tongue. Okay, and so sometimes it's not everything <laughs> that is worth repeating. You know, she's good for herself, you know, for me, yeah, yeah. woman. But she, give her a chance, give her a chance, she, you know. So I didn't put it, and then I give, and then I shared it with one or two colleagues of mine, um, politically and linguistic wise. And they, uh, they told me to change things. I says no, I cannot diminish, cut down, reduce anything I have to say about Patrick because. This was the right day. This was the right platform. This was the right opportunity to project onto the world the man who was lying in that coffin, whom I knew from a child, and who, before we send him off, we had to tell the world who he really was. So, I mean, other people might, I was not afraid. And I'm happy and grateful for all the tidbits I'm getting from former. Um, clerical workers of the Ministry of Education, former policemen, former Defence Force members, former family um, family members. People have gotten calls from Australia, New Zealand, Holland, Paramaribo, Suriname, Austria, Germany, all over the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, and from all over Dominica, of people telling me they are happy, they were afraid. The Frederick because they're family in Dominica. Hey, I have nothing to lose. There is nothing they can take from me again. There is nothing they can do to me again that can prevent mm. me from speaking the truth that I know about anybody. Yeah, thank you for that, Simeon. And what I did, uh, the eulogy was part of Talk on the Block on Q95 uh, FM on Friday. So yeah. I went ahead and shared the podcast to that program on the Facebook Live. So for anyone who's interested, you can simply go on Q95DA.com, click on Podbim, and you will see uh, October 1st was Friday. Uh, the hot seat from October 1st, and they'll be able to hear the entire eulogy. But Alex, um, I'd like you to chime in yeah, your yeah, thoughts. I yeah, I share the same view that Simeon expressed in terms of people speaking up and not being... And I think, I think um, the audience is saying your mic is a little low, so I'm not sure if you can adjust it in any way. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I can speak up a bit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but, so I, I, I share the view that Simeon expressed in terms of being bold to speak up because I would have been victimized a number of times over. I can't even count the number of times I was victimized. I mean, I was fired and ridiculed. And even right now, whenever I speak as a professional, there is some belittling that sometimes or most times take place. People who are professionals, lawyers, doctors, just like me, a professional, finding that their professionalism is better than mine. When we both did what we had to do, use different tracks. I can respect you because you're a lawyer now. When we were younger, you were, you, were, you didn't have the profession. Now you are a lawyer. They call me a political scientist. But you think you are a better qualified person because we are in different tracks. So anytime I speak, because people do not like my politics, they sometimes try to put me in a box. Even having done all the research, and presenting the material as any professional would have done. So I am not scared. I always speak. And like Simeon said, I'm asking Dominicans to speak. Because if we do not speak, we will not be empowered. I only got empowered when I started speaking. Yes, there, there, there's backlash that will follow. But you end up getting information. You, you end up opening up to the world. And Simeon told you the number of calls that he had. That's what happens when people speak. You are more empowered. You see a bigger light. You are even get you even get bigger support. If you stay quiet and pretend as if you're scared, you're not gonna get anything. It's when you speak up, you get in the stuff that really must come here. So I, again, I, I echo Simeon's views, and as Dominicans, those who know what they know to speak up, because unless we do that, we're going to remain in a country where the status quo continues to yeah. run rough over the people's yeah. wishes and demands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have a government in power for God's sake for 20 years, going on 25. Simon, don't you think that's enough for one party, one ruling group? I mean, there's, I mean, which other country in the Caribbean that, that, that can boast of that? It is just not the ideal for any democracy. No, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in the people who are leading. It is just that for a state, for a country, you do not normally see that in any democracy. So it's time to just have a, a, a movement 
But that's not going to happen until people decide for it to happen. And okay. more people should be speaking up. No, I'm not here to yeah. say that we should take out the government, you know. I'm just using that as a point of reference in terms of people doing things, speaking up and taking actions that is necessary that will benefit them in the long run. And no, those, yes, people who yes, are scared, yes. those people who are scared for the government to change, probably they're scared because they, there's no hope for them if the government changes. For me, government change or not, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. It right. doesn't matter. I mean, and, and, sure, and, 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 and Alex, and whether sure. a government, whether a government changes or not, once you have life and you can see tomorrow, the future is yours. And your future is not defined by a government. Your future is not defined by a, a, a politician in power. But your but let me but let me let me let me be advocate here for a minute, Simeon, yeah. because that might be true. But yeah. think of the average person without a job, without an income, and their only resource is to go to the, the government. How to, unfortunate. To How unfortunate. unfortunate. But it's How unfortunate. It is and a reality. These, these, people, these people must I'll search study. within themselves and go and dig deep within their own resources, capabilities, potential, and ask themselves, how can I, okay, you, um, um, how you call it, realize my own potential? Mm -hmm. The world needs all sorts of people. Which is, the, which is simple, the Simeon. Huh? Which is very simple. The people who think that they have to depend on a system or a group or a politician or a party for survival, just pick up. And your dependency goes away. I'm telling and your, you. That. And your independence. You know, you're Simon, do you know how much I have suffered? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to go on the mountaintop and say that. I know what I have been denied and what I have been deprived. Simon, let me tell you two early examples in my life. In 1982, I was the valedictorian at my graduation in grammar school. Do you know that the then Minister of Education called grammar school to find out why was the son of Sylvester Joseph made the valedictorian at grammar school. Because I was a liberate and Freedom Party was at its zenith at the time. Fast forward a few years after when I got a job at the aid bank for the first time. And I was interviewed with three other people. Do you know that when I got the job at the aid bank, the then manager of the aid bank was questioned why was the son of Sylvester Joseph given a job at the aid bank? And, and even in most recent times, I mean, uh, that's, that, that will be told sooner rather than later. But through it all, I have maintained my dignity. I have not compromised my, my, my conscience. And I have realized with or without, I am going to live because I'm a child of God. And as long as you're a child of God and the sun is right, God will provide. If you see as your provider a man, flesh and blood then you will depend on flesh and blood. But if you are convicted within yourself that your provider is God above, no human being can interfere with the provision that God has destined for you. But when you, switch, when you switch God's role and you let you tell God, he, does, he will not provide and man will provide, God will leave you to man will provide and you will perish at the mercies of man. And Amen. so Jesus in the desert was there for 40 days, fasting, with nothing to eat. Man came to tempt him, and he informed that devil that man does not live on bread alone. I will not put my God to the test, and God has the power. And we have to do that. We have to be able prepared to make that sacrifice in the name of truth. And unless we are willing to do it, we are being complicit in the perpetuation of the suppression of truth, of justice, of right, and of equal opportunity. Yeah. We have and, to understand that. And again, I, I do not want to go so hard on the people who do not know, because they really probably do not know that empowerment lies in them, claiming in their them. own empowerment. And, and that, that's, that's, it's sad. And that's what we would people... like to echo tonight. Yeah. If you speak, when you speak, when you stand up, you get empowered, you get independent, and the doors will open up for you. Even if the people who give you pretend that they are little gods and quote the scriptures, to, that is the most dangerous thing a leader can do when they try to manipulate people by calling on the, the name of the Almighty. That's what the kings did. The kings 
the divine, the, the rule well, of the divine and also, authority. Well, also the colonizers. Yeah, they rule in the name of the, of the of God. They said, I am God's embodiment on earth. And if you go against me, you go against God. <laughs> so well, I'm, 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 that was that was a colonizing thing. And well, I'm hearing yes, it being used in our present yes, context. Alex, Alex, in, in, in terms of eschatology, eschatolo eschatology, which is a branch of theology that speaks about the ushering of the kingdom, there is a line, Schumacher, one of the leading theologians, he said, in your search for God, when you meet God, kill him. Yes. Because the God you yes. think you would have discovered, because God is unknowable, God is unreachable. And if you think, if, if you think you have, you are able to touch and reach a God, this is not the real God. So get rid of that God whom you think is God, because you will not be able to arrive at seeing the one and true God. That's an eschatological statement. That's an eschatological reality that we have to kill the gods and the demigods. We have to be able to cast aside those mantras and idols that we have put up there as masters of our life and put our face towards that one true God. Because if our face is facing that one true God and that one true God is shining on us, Nothing, nothing can touch us. We may lose. And, we may even be killed. And, we will and, be and, dismembered like the saints of old. But we will go to our graves with virtue. And these are the things. Yes, and Alex, we're going to come to you. And then I want us to talk about the legacy. We have to touch on <laughs> the legacy of Patrick before we, we sign this evening. So Alex, to you, and then we're going to jump into that part of the conversation. Yeah, well, these are the things I'm hearing Patrick John. Whenever Simeon speaks, I'm hearing Patrick. Because that is Patrick for you. He was a very, very, very faithful guy. God-fearing. Irrespective to whatever people may say about Patrick. Patrick had this belief, this self-belief, this, this self-worth, this conviction in a power greater than his. And he always say he leave everything in the hands of God. I think he left well, I guess I can't say he left too many things. Certain things he could have done more. God would help. God would have helped him if he had done certain things for himself. But he trusted God. Um, so I'm not here to judge him religiously or spiritually. But when I when Simeon speaks, that is Patrick John speaking. Pa that's what Patrick John would tell me every time about his belief, his faith, what people need to do, how people should stand up. And again, people just need to claim their deliverance, claim their salvation, claim their belief, claim their self worth and they will proceed. And again, see, man, I, I, do not, I do not know how to further emphasize. There are some people who blame the people. Sometimes I don't really blame the people. You know. I blame those who keep the people perpetually blinded. Because if Dominicans, and when Dominicans lay there, a lot of people will take the, 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 the thing, you know. Because Dominicans will not remain in that state for too long again. Because, I mean, it's 20 years of one ruling, of one group. And also since independence, the same ruling class, save a few years? No. And there's nothing wrong with the people. There's something wrong with the system and the leaders of the people. And we're going to get it right. I believe in the goodness of every Dominican. Oh, yeah. And we'll get and so it right. So there's God allows people to go through certain things eh, before he leads them to the promised land. Because yeah. we have to do some self-examination. And Dominicans have a lot of self-examination to do. That dog eat dog mentality. That backstabbing mm -hmm. mentality, mm -hmm. that undermining mentality, that 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 constant thirst to destroy people's reputation and to and to bring people down to nothing and to take revenge. Our society has become a society that is devoid of love and compassion and empathy for others. And maybe that is why God is allowing us to be in that wilderness before we actually open our eyes to reach where we want to reach. Simon and Alex, I'm not sure if you are watching the comments. There are two people who have made comments, and I don't mind addressing Valder Henry has said, can you explain oh, thank why, you. Patrick, thank you. why Patrick did not want to right the wrongs while he was alive? And I, I appreciate Valder. And you see, thank you. I, I, Valder, I have a lot of respect for. She's an inquiring mind. She's a very eclectic person. And she's one of the persons who is in the search, who, who I know is constantly in the search for truth. Valder and Alex can share with you. That is something that I begged Patrick to do over and over and over. And I'll begin with, with a situation I had with PJ in 2018 when I went. I said, PJ, before you die, I want to mount an exhibition on you 
with your voice notes, with letters, with pictures where people can come and speak to you mm. during independence. Patrick told me that if I were to do it during independence, it would overshadow the independence celebration. And he doesn't want to be the focus of Dominica's independence celebrations. On several occasions as well, um, Patrick just felt that, okay, he should not be the one, to, because he was never, Valder Patrick was never in the habit of defending himself. No. He was like Jesus always before pa Pontius Pilate, led to the slaughter, the innocent lamb, led to the slaughter, knowing that his conscience was clear and he need not have to defend. That those who knew him knew him, that those who knew the truth knew the truth, and the liars and the perpetuators, one day would be exposed them to God. for the deceptors that they are. Lead okay? And yeah. so um, I warned him and I told him, you don't want us to do it in your life, but it's going to be in your death. And yes. you are going to speak louder from the grave than you would have ever spoken in your entire lifetime. And I promised him that. Yeah, the and second it seems like that's what's happening right now. The second that's person whom I see making some sarcastic comments is this Carrington lady from this party or whatever. And I'm going to answer oh. her now. So she asked to speak about the Bay of Pigs and the Dread Acts. And Alex, let's clear that one up. Yes, okay. Because remember in the <laughs> mid-early 70s, what was happening in Dominica with the dreads? Mm -hmm. That while they may, not, they may not have been all that bad, they were sort of misconstrued in their thinking of Rastafarianism and dreadlocks mm -hmm. and were misled into... Not, yes, well, there were two factions, remember? There yes, were the yes, yes, yes. And there yes. were the dreads. And they were the dreads, not the nomtes. So, so the nomtes were the people who were civil, who were right. into their agriculture, right. into the levity. And, 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 and living that transformational life of nature at its best. Right. Eat what you grow, grow what you eat. Credit right. to them. Right. The, the dread. And remember, Sipekin Alex, Sipekin Alex, in Patrick John time, when the Ministry of Agriculture was, was developing the, 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 the agricultural program, as in the manifesto, because that was the first object, diversification of agriculture, that tagline became the Ministry of Agriculture tagline. Eat yes. what you grow and grow what you eat. And it came from the dreads. Came from the dreads. And came the from the dreads. Dread. Dread. The dreads were Patrick, Patrick friends. The yeah. Dread. Yeah, now they, and then, they saw the dreads like Pocosion and Tumba. Those right. guys were bad guys. Right. They had been overseas, like for instance, Pocosion had been overseas and he they were against white people. So they were they were bad guys. And the Nomte was not in them kind of a violent thing. They were mainly homegrown Nomte. So when the dreads and Nomte were up in the hills, they were all categorized as dreads. Yeah. So they created a lot of havoc, the dreads. And yes. F. Peter paid for Paul. Yes. And the Dread Act was the most popular act. Alex, you cannot just go to the Dread Act. Okay, sorry. Let's. Uh, they were pillaging people's plantations. They were doing bad things. Farmers couldn't go to their gardens. Yeah. Livestock was being stolen. Yeah. Two girls were Ladies kidnapped were hijacked and brought to the hills. Used that they were decimating place. farmers' properties in the hills. And so was, PJ decided, and the good thing about that is that was the that was the only act in the history of Dominica to have got a hundred percent unanimous support from both sides. That act was not drafted by Patrick John. That act was drafted by Eugenia Charles and the Freedom Party and others. Opposition lawyers. And they came to the house and supported Patrick in that dread act. And mm -hmm. what they did afterwards, they turned on Patrick and let and people let believe it's Patrick. Patrick. Who drafted okay. that? The Freedom Party came to the house and voted unanimously with Patrick to pass that act. I clearly remember that because that okay. night, one of the things I used to do is listen to the debate in parliament that used to go 10, 11 o'clock and I'd sit down on the floor of my parents' mm -hmm. home and listen to the House of the Assembly debates every time throughout my entire life until the Freedom Party came into power one day. And take it out and let Parry Bello do his own version of the House of the And those party. kind of things there. All right, and so people enough. made it look like PJ was the one who think if that was the case. Do you know when Patrick went up in St. Joseph in 1975, 1985, and running? You know who campaigned for him at most? His foot soldiers were the Rastafarians and the dreads, the same people because and they were the ones who helped him to win the election so many, in 1985. There are so many things the I can't thing about Sophia in the Bay of Pugs is that I want to tell Sophia a question. 
that she needs to come clean and be an authentic, genuine politician, not a mask of the fake that she is. Okay, She's not a politician. And that she has to understand that politics is not only about living as a pie in the sky myth. Okay, of trying to influence the political sphere without knowledge, history, background, philosophy, political savviness, or the ability to come forward and face the music. Okay, and she needs to end her own platform and postulation of trying to pretend to be a politician when all she really is is some substance of, 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 of fluidity without the right vertebrae encased in the right membrane to be a politician. In her defense, I'll leave it at that. In her, defense, yes, <laughs> in her defense, she told me she wasn't a politician. I tried okay. engaging her and telling her, hello. She said, I'm not a politician. I said, okay, but your party, our party and your leader. She said, well, she I reminds okay. me of these people. She reminds I, me of these people who go around saying they're not in politics. What hypocrites? What hypocrites? She, you pay taxes. You but pay taxes. A, yeah, you, you, very, any very, Dominican uh, who uh, tell you they're not in politics is a hypocrite. Because a the very fact of paying taxes, using roads, going to the hospital, sending it, that's politics. Politics is about people. You may not be into party politics, but for people to say they're not in politics, these are hypocrites who want to eat from both sides, who don't want to take a stand, who want to be neutral and fall for nothing. And so yeah. that makes these people non-entities without any significance of a platform to stand on. I know yeah. somebody who's in government today whom I remember who's a minister today and was always saying, I'm not in politics, I'm not in politics, but he, look at where he is today. And if you're not in politics, and that happens, that person happens to be a, a relative of mine, so I can jump that fence. So, 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 and I've heard many people say they're not in politics. And when push comes to shove, you're hearing them deeply entrenched into the bowels of political party, getting things on the side and getting things in the dark of night. Hey, as long as you don't curse people, as long as you're not disrespectful, as long as you're not treasonous, politics is your right to be in. Okay? And that, that, that's... that's Thank you, thank you, Simeon. But I really wanted to to to, 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 to at least three points. If we can get at least three points in terms of, for example, how would Patrick wants to be remembered? Okay, I, I want to take the lead on that, you know. Okay, because go ahead. you see, Patrick cannot be remembered without looking at his legacy. And there are many Dominicans, and one of the things that I've got, one of the WhatsApp messages that I've gotten the most are people who have told me they never knew Patrick did all those things. All they heard about him, he was the first prime minister, and that he tried to overthrow. They never knew that when they drove around, when they drove around Dominica, and they witnessed all those things, that it was because of Patrick John. Patrick John was with Patrick, so as his preeminent achievement, the, con the, the, the beginning of the social security. security. Now, before that, people were working without welfare benefits. There was the National the the Provident, Provident Fund. Provident Fund yeah. And so mm -hmm. Patrick decided, like the United States of America and the United Kingdom, to bring to Dominica legislation to establish the Dominica Social Security to what it is today. The External Trade Bureau, when the mercantile class of Dominica was hoarding sugar and hoarding flour and hoarding right. rice and not want to sell it and wanting to jack up prices. And so Patrick, and them, and at one time the today, a pound of sugar was ten dollars. Another time is twenty-five cents. Ten, sorry, ten cents. Another time is twenty-five cents. Next shipment there is none, and they hoarding the, the the sugar in their in their storerooms until the next shipment came. Patrick established the external trade bureau and took over the vending of rice, sugar, basic, and flour basic, as yeah. we have today. That has turned into Dexia. It was called the external trade bureau. So that the poor people of Dominica were not denied and deprived sugar when they wanted it and rice and flour when they needed to buy it. We have the construction of the Deepwater Harbor, the Canefield Airstrip, the houses in Canefield, Pen Michel, Baff Estate, and Calibishi. Okay, the establishment of diplomatic relationships with Cuba, isn't that so? And Venezuela, mm -hmm. isn't that so? Patrick yeah, also. Yeah, mm -hmm. what's that? Closer relations with France. Extended, expanded the, 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 at that time, it was the Clifton Jupiney Community College under Mr. H.L. Christian. Expanded things like the workshop for the bland, assisted the, in the formation of the Alpha Center, the commencement of the Old Mill Cultural Center, um, prim, health, primary health care centers around Dominica. The, the, the National Bank. 
the Sansover School, the Wesley School, the completion of the, 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 the completion of the construction of the Calibishi School, and, and, and those sorts of things there. Patrick also went on to establish the local government community development division, mm -hmm. which was a major arm of government that was financed by the British Development Division, which would empower mm -hmm. local communities and village councils for the improvement and the development of village councils. That's and village leadership. councils were responsible for building health centers, feeder roads, um, um, youth centers, community centers. The Marigot Hospital was open under Patrick John with funds channeled through the, um, the old one, Department of Local Government, and built by Marigot people with their own bare hands. And that was part of it. Yes, and, and then the, 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 the establishment of the Montuapito National Park. That was under Patrick John um, and a number of other things. The, who did can you forget the National did you mention the Bank? National Bank. When, when, when he wanted to establish it, you know what the Freedom Party said at a meeting in Roseau Lago? That Panchit wanted more money to put and, 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 and advise Dominicans that they should not take shares to establish the National Bank. And so they used to call it the Quapo Bank. Sim, uh, just so they used to call the houses in Bath Estate the um the 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 they were not good for pig styles. Pig yeah. Yes, I remember Patrick, that. Patrick I remember that. Patrick created the Banana Growers Association and expanded it and made sure that he introduced the fertilizer Extension. scheme for farmers. Extension that, 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 that businesses in Dominica were selling fertilizer to farmers at exorbitant cost. And so he, he brought the importation of fertilizer under the Banana Association so that farmers in Dominica could purchase fertilizer at reasonable prices. The list is endless, you know. The Wrong. completion of the West Coast Road. Yeah. Okay. And that is, the, and, the construction of the Isaiah Thomas Secondary School. Okay. The construction of the Isaiah Thomas Secondary School, which, which they tried to boycott and which bureaucrats at the CDB in Barbados and senior bureaucrats in Dominica tried to through the, through, the, through, the, through the Caribbean Development Bank. Yep. And I, I know the names of those persons. Rich, they can rich. show me a letter. Of, preach, of, brother, of, preach. of letters <laughs> and i can show it to you I, the, no, written no, by no, dominicans no, 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 no. written by dominicans to stall those projects let us no. not forget the great national trade patrick started harry spence in Focole with Ninian marie okay patrick also let us um start it what was there's something i was going to mention that i must mention um um before I was mentioning Harry Spence, it slipped my mind. So there were all these accomplishments of Patrick John that, that people in four years, four and a half years, does that sound familiar? Okay. And to see what Patrick did. Okay. And then we, and then opening up of lands. Many state lands were made available to farmers of Dominica under the leadership of Patrick Roland John and Oliver Serfin when he was agriculture minister in Dominica. Give him his, give Jack his jacket. Patrick started the junior secondary program which we have, which the Freedom Party inherited and universal secondary education. Because in 1979, there was a commission head led by the University of the West Indies on expansion of education and one of the items in the report was the improvement of skills education just the junior secondary program the training of teachers okay and access universal access to all children of dominica for universal secondary education it is documented in the archives of mr hl christian and if anybody wants me to prove it to them, I have the writings of Mr. Christian, the then Minister of Education, to substantiate just that. Okay? Yes, and let's so let, let, let Alex get a, a minute, um, Simeon, so he can yeah. share his... Uh, okay. his Simeon is but thank correct. you, Simeon. Thank you for your passion, and thank you for sharing all yeah. that wonderful information. Simeon is on a roll, and all the items that Simeon mentioned can be a legacy item for Patrick John. So just pick one. And he was also the first prime minister he brought us to independence. So that's pick one of the several items, and that is his legacy. A legacy is something that no one can take from you or change or deny or diminish. You see the apartments that are built now? A government can just come and bulldoze that away because who owns it? You see the Baffested apartments? Nobody can touch them because people own them. There are bill of sale on those apartments. There's ownership. There is value to these apartments. 
you see the establishments that of the of the social security and all these things simone these are line legacy items that pj has under his belt more than a dozen in terms of his legacy as a leader of dominica show me one legacy or one item that let's say the current leader can claim will last for 50 years after him none and we can go back down the line and talk about the legacy of mr james he certainly does have one damien jr does have forget eo libla we can he does have a legacy is something that you have accomplished as a leader of a country that cannot be changed irrespective to what so the legacy of patrick how he wants to be remembered is as a humble man a man who looked out for people who cared for people and who tried to establish opportunities for people to succeed and survive the pj that i know and spoke with simone would not have wanted two viewings one for the people and one for the officials simeon can tell me i'm wrong if you want pj if i know him well would have preferred one viewing one viewing because he was a person for the people and if he had to choose he would choose the viewing at the at the, at the stadium that's how pj was he didn't care about the, the value and the splendor he appreciated it but if he had a choice he would be with his people so maybe that's one of the things that pj might have said if he was able to speak let just keep me in the in the thing eh, and let everybody come and see me there ministers and government can come there keep me there patrick that's what, his humility is what drove him and with all the accomplishment that simeon mentioned and he could simeon could continue pj well yeah he's talk about your security and, and and other things but he sees to me his biggest accomplishment as being the one who represented the little man stand up for the ordinary man and give people an opportunity to fend for themselves yeah and that brings us back to the exhibition you mentioned before yes. um simeon but before yes. we go there before we go there uh, dr damien Dublin wants to know what is wrong with a party evolving because you guys mentioned before that the labor party of today is not as the same no. as yesterday so he wants party. to know yes. what is wrong with a, 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 a party Let me evolving Dr. Dobbs, the Labour Party did not evolve, it was hijacked. The party, not, the party could not have evolved from what the party was, from its fundamental values to what it is now. Dr. Dobbs, the Labour Party that you knew, that sent you to school, well, should I say Labour because it was not quite Labour, it was more an arrangement with Ruzi. But let's say let's 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 give that to you the party that schooled you dr Dobbs, is not the party that is in office today because the fundamentals are totally different so if you are evolving you don't evolve into something less you evolve into something more the labor which was labor gave people an opportunity to fend for themselves the labor that is labor now give people and say remember who give you who put you in the house and permit a pay was who mash kimun that is not labor the labor that was labor was the labor that created an enabling environment for people to be able to, to to have something in their name like simon's mom and the house in bafeste like tao in kalibishi tao for yay people that's what labor did what is happening now is not what labor would have done if labor had evolved into something so you don't evolve less you evolve into something that is more spectacular. So that's why I said, my dear friend, Dr. Dobbs, that the Labour Party was hijacked. The framing of Labour was hijacked, and a, an, a, a power arrangement was superimposed on the frame of Labour. And when Labour rights really realize that, they will declare we and they will shall be with us. Because that, to me, Dr. Dobbs, you have to agree with me that what we have is essentially palatable. It cannot be. Simeon. Okay. So I have one response to Dr. Blenin, and the key word that he used was evolving. Political parties are based on philosophies, principles, policies, and practices. Policies may change. Practices may change and evolve. Philosophies Philosophy. and principles do not evolve. Right. And so Dr. Dublin must ask himself, when he looks at the philosophies and principles of labor can that evolve the principles of labor and the 
the, the, the principles and the philosophies of labor cannot evolve. Now, when you compromise your principles, which defines your policies and your practices, and you merge it with a, a, with, with a principle that is in antithesis to yours, which is the case because the now. principle of the Freedom Party can never, ever, under the light of day, be the same principles the principle of, the of the Freedom Party. Of the, of the, you understand? And so, therefore, when you have the labor and freedom coming together and you want to merge those principles, you will know fully well that the policies and the practices will be bereft of any substance. And so, therefore, that is why it cannot evolve. Philosophy, Dr. De, Dr. Damien Dublin cannot change who he is. He's philosophically Dr. Debian Dublin, who he is, right? His principles is what he is. He can be a different dentist tomorrow in terms of his practices. He may change his location. His, his policy of attending his to his companies may change. But Dr. Dublin will remain who he is philosophically. And who so is a good man, a good man, incidentally. Yeah? Yes. And he's a very good man, my very good friend. So I wish, to ask, friend. I wish to ask Dr. Dublin, can he evolve? Can he be a different Damien Dublin tomorrow in terms of philosophy huh? and principles? That's my answer to that question. If we're talking about evolving. Yes, and I think I think Leslie raised an important point. And I, I do wish you guys will come back so we can continue this conversation, Simeon and, and, and Alex, because I think it's very engaging and quite a few people have already stated that they've learned so much from being on this Facebook Live this evening. So I truly hope that you all will join us again. And I also yeah. hope that the conversation will continue on this uh, particular Facebook episode, because unfortunately we will not be able to get to all the comments tonight. But Leslie Charles says the authorities in Dominica should call a full statue of PJ at some prominent location in Dominica. Is that something we should expect is that something that we see as feasible how will patrick john be remembered physically okay, in so dominica I, I, i'm going to take the lead on that yes. and i want alex to continue and expound upon it okay so on the death of patrick john when i met with the entire family um on the instructions of mrs john i brought both sides of the family together the first set of children of patrick and the children of desri john we basically uh, spoke on moving forward and one of the things that 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 we, we said that patrick must not die because coming from naomi and patricia and nairi and renick um they feel that their father's legacy must move on one of the things that we decided on was to do a Patrick John Foundation and with the, um, what do you call it, the inspiration of Alex, I would say, to do a Patrick John Foundation for history. But the family has said that they would like a, 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 a foundation for heritage. So the idea is to establish a Patrick John Foundation for history and heritage. And so what that will do, Alex will deliver the historical part, I will deliver the heritage part, and Alex will explain some more. Patrick was very concerned for the um, decline with the sorry with the decline of the state of um, historical sites in Dominica and the, the heritage buildings in Dominica. He lamented the fact that all those historical areas in Dominica were not being upkept and they were not being properly funded, and sourcing of funds was not um, forthcoming in the maintenance. And he also lamented the fact of a number of all the buildings in Dominica being destroyed. I know that for a fact. And Desiree is very much in favor of that. So the heritage part would be start the foundation where we begin to seek funding and establish a trust so that all these historical sites around Dominica can be discovered, can be preserved, can be maintained. And we have Desiree and I have already spoken with two or three organizations and also Dr. Lennox Honeychurch and a few other people to become part of that trust whereby um, we can solicit the necessary funds to provide for the maintenance and upkeep of those historical and heritage sites around Dominica. The political part, I now pass on to Alex to expound upon. Yeah, well, Patrick was an educator all his life. And he believed in empowering people 
He lamented the fact that the lack of political knowledge is a problem. And until, until and unless people get a full understanding of the system, they will be doomed to repeating the same old mistakes. For instance, my dear friend Dr. Dobbs asking about parties evolving. I mean, it just it, you cannot evolve out of what you are into something less than you than what you are. The philosophy remains. So Patrick was very concerned about people not knowing. And seeing that he was our first prime minister, he was a politician, he was somebody who, who was the epitome of a statesperson. The foundation will also represent that. And people who are interested in civic political knowledge and they are qualified, if there are funds to substantiate such a um, program, will be assisted to study, to research, to do workshops dealing with Dominica's civic political education to the point of view, even to university level, if the foundation has the money to take care of that. So this forever shall be part of Patrick's remit to help to broaden people's minds in terms of understanding the systems and what goes on around them. Because he believed an educated populace, an educated electorate, a knowledgeable electorate is a more savvy and more potent electorate. So that will form part of the uh, of the foundation's work as well. Yes, thank you for that. And you also plan on doing some writing, um, Alex, as well. We can expect something. Oh, yes. Um, I'm well advanced. I'm, I'm on well advanced with, um, with the book, Patrick John, the man. Um, which Patrick told me he had been writing. I know Patrick had notes, but he had not, you know, completed it. He didn't give me his notes, but I have this information that he gave me. And yes, I started writing. The book is almost written. I just have to put this transcribe what is what was there. And the idea is to have the foundation take care of the launching of the book. It would be nice if we get that done in time for Patrick's birthday in, the, in January. So it wouldn't be very long again for Dominicans to read a piece in terms of what um, we're going to present in terms of Patrick's story. And I expect Simeon to write a book as well, and other people to write books as well. The more books we have is the better. The more works that we have written is the better. But I am certainly putting on a piece, uh, maybe 10 or 12 chapters about Patrick John. And in one of the chapters, I'm trying to do some work on the, the, the story of the Labour Party. Nothing had been written about the Labour Party. And there's so much information that Simeon has. So we have to put something down so people can reference tomorrow. Students are really hungry for this for this information, and um, yes, Patrick John the Man will be in the book on the bookshelves nearby sometime very very soon in the future. And I must say it is authorized. I have the blessings of the family Desri for sure, and my colleague and friend Simeon Joseph, um, who is, for all intents and purposes, assisting with the guidance for the complete for the completion of the text. Yes, excellent. So I hope that you will stop by to give us updates on the projects in terms of how we are creating the legacy and how in terms of how we are preserving the memory, because it doesn't matter our opinion of Patrick John. The truth of the matter is he was the very first prime minister of Dominica. And that is yes. not a, a truth that can be taken from him. So he has to be memorialized, whatever your opinion of him. He has to be more moral as the very first prime minister of Dominica. Alex, I see you. One of, you have a comment? one of the things that Patrick said is, Alex, how can a history of someone be written about them? And nobody's asking the person to say something about his story. <laughs> can anyway, you, can you imagine you that? Yes, as Mr. Libla would say, one of Mr. Libla's favorite um, local proverbs be "Hi, Shen, Medi Daibla." man. You're writing a history of Patrick. Patrick is alive and well, and no one talks to Patrick. Nobody. So no Patrick said, So Patrick said, "As this version, who will write this story is his story, but that is not right. his Patrick's story." Mm -hmm. So we will do all we can to present. Patrick's version of history from his perspective. He is the history maker. He is the one you're writing about. And you're not asking him his perspective. So we're going to present what Patrick say about his story. And we'll see how it pans up against the history that is written about Patrick, including the Bay of Pigs nonsense yeah. that keeps coming up. Yeah. 
Because many so I want to, I just, I want to find out your final thoughts as we get ready to wind down this particular session. And I'm already looking for the next, looking forward to the next conversation. Everyone on Facebook is saying we need a part two. So oh, I'm wow. already securing your commitment for a part two. And I just want everyone on the Facebook live to continue the conversation because I think we're having a very important dialogue where despite our differences, we're being respectful Yes. to each other's opinion. So I'm happy to see the, the, the differences in the dialogue on the Facebook Live. I, although we disagree, it is so important to be respectful. And as Alex knows me very well, so he knows that's what my platform is all about. You know, see me on my scan me there for a minute, you know, Alex. I say, oh, oh I forget no, to read yeah, me on the right act okay. before he came on. If you had this, okay, remember he taught you in Sunday school. So you... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Then again, I remember my Sunday school classes with Simeon and I said to sit up straight. Simeon is okay, trust me. That my, I know him. That's my brother. He's fine. He was Simeon, did you have to sit up straight? Yes, you have to sit I up. did. <laughs> did I scare you that much? <laughs> you don't <both> scare her. <laughs> okay, so final I just thoughts, have, guys. my final thoughts are is just, you know, in the midst of all of this, of trying to as I said, not canonize Patrick, don't make him into a but to tell the true story. The the camera, story. Yeah, but to tell the true story of who Patrick was, I am, I am, I am sort of deeply saddened by the sarcastic innuendo comments of many persons who uh, would like to undermine that effort. I've seen comments of people who, un, who, who sadly, you know, they are not coming from even current members of the domain they are coming from people who support this current labor party government and the statements and comments they are making to me that raises questions about the genuineness and the authenticity of the association of labor because even if you may not be happy with patrick but the fact that a predecessor of the labor party is being honored and spoken about and you are trying to discount it and to make those kind of disparaging distasteful nasty comments about me and people speaks volumes and the labor party will be better off without people like you but somebody will um, answer that in creole because the labor party were original grassroots people sakia of uh google macho masipaliba you can not fe come see you say le ba me parler ba c'est c'est même mon la qui la le bruzi mo des jours um qui passe la été anniversaire le mo yo ay go tant sur di yo kay mete en gros statut pour vous yo pou ko faire ça il n'y passe 20 années pour ka croire ça le ba patrick donne te moun le ba premier ministre dominique il reste là jusqu'à il mort pour yo actuellement venir ka parler contre patrick john ça c'est le ba ou pas ça les bas les pas pas ça ils volent pendant un bité ils pas philosophe les bas c'est philosophe les bas ça qui a tout mal à c'est un bité un arrangement pour pouvoir et ces mouns là ils ont servi non les bas pour y profiter les bas et toutes ces mouns les bas ils ont pas capté j'ai honte ça ça c'est toute mon époudre mouns ça fait moi attention les gens disent ça contre moi ma mère les a eu dit ça même pas capable de manger pour manger pas capable de bité pour mon boire you pass a touch a moi, you sa trouble you le, ça c'est ça fait yo. Ça qui a tellement la Dominique c'est pas les bas. Ça pas les bas maman moi, grand maman moi, grand papa moi. Monsieur Joseph Osborne Theodore, Bolly Williams c'est mon ça, Elkin Henry, Elford Henry. Ça pas les bas. Ça pas les bas. Pour ça, c'est mon les bas. Réfléchis, regardez c'est mon qui a suivi ça, c'est mon qui a conduit ça. Ma de objection. Et quand c'est mieux dit, quand c'est mieux dit. C'est mon la qui a cisé là et yon la qui a supporté ce bitin ça. Yon est pour catcher les croyants. Et yon peut les bouillir. Ça m'a fait ce mon salon. Et si yon dit que yon a un bitin, un biologi là ou a, il dit, il n'y a pas de monde qui a coûté actuellement. De la place là ou bien à la radio, yon est pour compter pénance. Parce qu'on pile moun fait bitin. On pile moun détruit moun. Et avec un pile moun fait patrick d'un souffert. Et ouais, Desri, ça, Desri John, c'est un matador. Moi, le bail l'on est là, parce que de nous, Desri, doubou pour Patrick. Moi, ouais, Desri, baye Patrick, mette Kadli à soui. Et il a fait signe à ce Patrick, il a dit, 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 il a dit
kisa kisa Jésus dit c'est mon créole, c'est mon habitation, c'est mon normal, c'est mon local. Et moi, je suis moi, je tout bien bon pour Dominique. Moi, je suis bon pour Dominique. Pas pour un certain monde seulement, Dominique. Ou pas ça conduit un pays par quoi ou même. Pas tu pas télé faire ça. Pas tu télé tout le monde conduit un pays. Ça, c'est manière et pas même la slang à office là. Et bien, moi, je finis pour ça. Pour toi, moi. Eh bien, merci, Alex. Merci. Moi, je suis content ou, ou même, moi, je suis pour parler créole parce que moi, je comprends tout ça au cadre. Eh bien, merci pour ça. <laughs> ça veut dire, ah, M. Mion? Ou c'est j'avais 15. Oui, papa, moi c'est j'avais 15. Moi c'est j'avais pas fait 7, mais moi ça parle <laughs> créole. Parce que uh, Alex avait non une chose, moi je me pour parler créole. Et yeah. tu as aussi un win créole. Oui, c'est ok. <laughs> okay. Oh, Simeon, so, thank you. It was a pleasure sharing this platform, this forum yeah. with you. I mean, I'm so proud of you, my dear brother. We're from the same village, same community, and I hope our villagers are proud of us at least. I hope. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so we just want to once again say our sympathies to Mrs. Desri John, and we want to thank her for being a part of the Facebook Live this evening to you and your family, and we will continue to work towards ensuring that the legacy of our very first Prime Minister, Mr. Patrick Roland John, will be preserved, and I'm happy to hear that plans are already in the works for preserving his legacy. So I want to thank everyone who joined us via Facebook Live, and I want to thank you for your respectable comments and for being a part of this conversation. So again, we look forward to part two, and we look forward to all the important conversations that we will have via Facebook Live. We encourage you to follow Push Past 10 for our continuing conversations that are important, of importance to Dominica. And again, I am Simone Matthew. I thank you for being here. And we look forward to engaging with you on yet another Facebook Live. Alex, Simeon, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Alex. Good night. Right. Good night. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>